All right, welcome back. Let's go across to Vinny now. She's got some trends that she's um, focusing on when it comes to the consumption space and some of the uh, themes that are showing up there as well. Uh, Vinny, take us through in terms of uh, the kind of uh, you know euphoria that we've seen on the index vis-a-vis -vis consumption and how that seems to have lost its luster a little bit. So, Ava, let's uh, firstly talk about the Nifty 50 as well as the FMCG index. When you look at it in the last one year, so the first six months of the last one year, we were seeing FMCG index was outperforming the Nifty 50. But post September, we are seeing that there's an underperformance given by the FMCG index compared to the Nifty 50. Now, in the last one year, we've seen Nifty 50 grow around 30%, uh, while FMCG index has managed to grow only 10%. So there's a clear underperformance that we're seeing coming in in the FMCG index, especially in the last six months. So let's talk about uh, the current trends that we've seen in quarter three is that discretionary spends are obviously coming back. The category is making a growth as well. While staples category has become uh, now seen as fairly uh, trajectory in Q3, Q2 as well. So is it that something that the investors are already pricing in is something that we're going to keep an eye out for because the performance uh, and value of FMCG companies' consumption stocks for certain stocks are quite high. So is that something that is impacting the overall performance uh, in terms of the market wise? Is that something that is impacting uh, the growth in the index? Now overall FMCG stocks have done quite well in terms of performance coming in quarter 2 and quarter 3. The volume growth of most companies have done uh, quite well in quarter 3 as well and they have improved uh, from a sequential basis as well. So that is something uh, very interesting and let's keep an eye out on that with the volume growth terms as well as the commodity price inflation is something that is going to be a concern for FMCG companies because whether you see its tea prices, coffee prices, palm oil prices, sugar prices, all of them are seen rising. So is that going to be a further gross margin pressure coming in on uh, the FMCG stock companies and the stock price as well? What is the performance going to be is something interesting that we will watch out for given that gross margins were already under pressure in Q2 as well. So let's see how that actually works out for FMCG companies going forward. Let's take that note forward, Vinny. Brilliant analysis. Thank you very much. Milan Sarvati and Manoj Menon, they both join us to talk about the dynamics of the FMCG sector. Uh, Manoj, good morning. Thank you for joining us. We are going through an interesting phase in the FMCG sector. One side is volume growth, which is not bad, pretty, pretty impressive actually. And on the other side are raw material pressures. Where do you think the the bend is going to be now. Will volume growth collapse because of a because of uh, what is happening on the pricing front, or do you think they both will sustain? The volume growth will remain high, and margins will also remain under pressure. Morning, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I think uh, it is it is not likely logically that uh, both uh, volume growth and uh, margin growth will uh, sustain. One of them have, will have to give uh, way to the other. And if you observe FNCG companies over the past say, two decades, you will always find that this growth of margin uh, access always keeps playing out. And I can see that companies are sacrificing uh, margins for growth in the current scenario. Uh, there are several reasons for that. But I feel that once you discount the post-COVID upsurge in consumption, you will have to find ways of sustaining the volume growth. And towards that, I feel pricing by consumer companies may be more benign. There may be more trade push given by companies just to sustain the volumes. I think inflation is a is a serious uh, concern. Uh, but at the same time, the COVID period has also given FMCG companies a strong base uh, through um, several cost-cutting measures they have taken. And also, I feel the rationalization of the advertising and sales promotion expenditure may have given them quite a few bits to play with in the margin space. So overall, I feel that companies will let uh, margins yield to growth and uh, the, the phenomenon of both growing is not likely to sustain. Hmm. <coughs> what is the story so far for consumer staples has been volume growth is decent and till Q3 they were also able to in a sense manage volume growth. Like Mr. Uh, Sarvate said, do you think Q4 onwards the situation will change? Hi, good morning. Uh, just a couple of points to highlight there. Uh, you know, uh, Q4 onwards, yes, the situation will change optically uh, because uh, particularly FMCG, uh, you know, had a good, uh, you know, first half last calendar. So to that extent, yes, uh, optically. Uh, 
Uh, but then the important point to note here is uh, in times like these, uh, you know, it's, it's extremely critical to look at uh, TTM trailing 12 months numbers or moving averages uh, to get a trajectory. Now, when I look at the trajectory, uh, you know, I'm extremely confident, uh, you know, given the uh, understanding what we have, uh, you know, network checks and conversations with, uh, you know, particularly unlisted companies, the trends, what they're seeing, etc. And also what the listed companies as a basket has reported, uh, you know, there seems to be a very clear trend of uh, formalization accelerating or put it differently, market share gains. Now, this is something, uh, you know, not necessarily Nielsen is picking up currently because of uh, the challenges in data collection at this point. The, just to summary to what I'm just trying to say is that, yes, the trajectory, uh, you know, is likely getting better going into, uh, you know, next year. Optically, it can even look, uh, uh, you know, good for some companies, uh, for some may not be, depending on the base last year. So that's point number one. The second aspect also to note here is that, uh, you know, the, the, when you spoke about uh, the inflation angle, and also I heard Milind's view on that, I completely agree with what Milind is saying. But only only small point I would add here is that, uh, you know, this is a little more Those are times in which, uh, you know, you, you actually see this value migration and also uh, in your p and you get a certain amount of operating leverage adjust. Uh, Mr. Sarvati, Asian Prince is growing, Dabur is growing, Imami is growing and Jubilant Pizza is also growing. Where do you think the post covid normalization will be the highest you know we are looking at prism we are looking at the numbers which include a bit of a revenge shopping or revenge consumption because of covid but when things will normalize in 2021 where do you think the laggards will emerge and where do you think the winners will emerge i think that the laggards will emerge in, uh, in the lower parts of the national hierarchy on basic needs during covid uh, food and uh, safety uh, products uh, they, they took a real big boost because of the situation then prevailing it is very natural that these will the growth in these areas will peter out uh, people will go back to discretionary uh, consumption and i think those growths will continue uh, i i feel that when it comes to this uh, revenge consumption we have to also keep in mind that unlike a simplistic model of covid coming and going we may have, uh, you know, successive peaks of uh, COVID waves and situation will continue to be uncertain. So, really speaking, the revenge consumption may or may not play out in one burst, as they say. It may have its uh, ups and downs. Secondly, I feel the whole, uh, the discussion that we are having may be missing out the side of consumer income. I feel a lot depends, uh, when it comes to volume growth, a lot depends on uh, not only the current levels of consumer income, but also it's spread across demographics and most importantly the expectations about future income. I feel the successive waves of COVID are also bringing in some higher degree of uncertainty about whether I will continue to get the same level of income next year. Uh, so I feel that there is still some uncertainty about how the future growth will pan out. But it is very clear that foods will uh, plateau out. Uh, other things uh, such as uh, safety and hygiene which received such a big uh, trigger during COVID will definitely peter out. Companies like Marico, for example, have already announced that they may dis even discontinue the hygiene portfolio that they have paid. And a lot of new players have jumped into this space. I think that will certainly peter out. In terms of long-term consumption, may not be FMCP, but uh, other larger consumption items like durables, etc., they, they may come back to some extent, but not because I, as I said, future incomes are still uncertain. Okay. <clears throat> Manoj, um, you know, if you talk about um, 
uh, companies and, and the way they've been innovating at this time. I mean, we've seen smaller packaging, we've seen uh, a move towards staples when demand was there. Uh, but now going forward, where do you see the growth? What are some of the trends that you see emerging as competition heats up? Okay, so uh, two two points to add here. Uh, just just taking from uh, what Milin just uh, you know commented about uh, the consumption, how does the pie would look like uh, going to next year? I'm also in the camp and completely agree with Milin that uh, you know it is likely to be discretionary as a basket in consumption, outperforming uh, you know the consumer's preference. And there's one important point which I just want to highlight that uh, you know. Yes, on a lower base in FI21, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, in general, consensus is uh, looking at, uh, let's say, a real GDP growth in double digits, right? And so, so from a consumer income point of view, uh, uh, you know, it can be extremely important combination, uh, you know, for discretionary consumption because, uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of surplus income, let's say, going into next year. So, that, that's one. Uh, the second aspect, uh, from a trend point of view, uh, what we are seeing, uh, in fact, what we have seen in the last six months, particularly, is that... Uh, the Indian, uh, you know, consumer staple companies uh, have actually been uh, very agile, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to innovation. So whether it's a Dabur, a Marico, Godrej Consumer, or even a Jyoti Labs, versus the basket of uh, Unilever or a Nestle or even a Procter & Gamble, uh, you know, has they have they're not really done much incrementally relative to the Indian basket. And I think one of the reasons actually has been that, uh, you know, Indians... Obviously, Indian companies are based in India, so your agility, uh, you know, is a little faster in this case. Whereas uh, in, in most of the MNCs, uh, you know, particularly the R&D part, is a little more than one country decision. Having said that, uh, you know, when I look at next year, uh, you know, the innovation what companies have done, uh, the Indian companies, I think will keep them in good stead. Just give you one number here. Nine months FI21, six uh, percent of Dabur's revenue actually has come from new products. Marico has added two to three percent of their last nine months revenue, if not more, uh, again from new products, and the trajectory uh, you know looks promising for both. So that's one trend. The second, uh, you know, is that uh, six months back there was a lot of uh, comment about what Geo will do and what about the retail consolidation. I think uh, it is still happening in the background, uh, you know, and that's something which most companies will watch very carefully. Point number three, uh, you know, as modern retail makes a comeback. Uh, you know, let's say when consumer starts going to a DMART, uh, you know, or, 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 or a big bazaar, uh, you know, more than what they have done in the last six, nine months, uh, the, it is linked to the innovation point, the innovation intensity uh, will likely get better. Point number four, uh, you know, you look at the recovering real estate, the general optimism, which I find in paints and building material space and even durables uh, is something which uh, you know, will continue. And lastly speaking, uh, you know, this is specific to one industry, which is jewellery. A uh, lot of postponed uh, uh, weddings of last year uh, essentially, uh, you know, appears good news for jewellery industry in general. Looking at the next one. Okay. Interesting. So some of the trends uh, to watch out there as well. Um, in terms of... Uh, you know, in terms of challenges going forward, Milind, whether it be to do with spending, whether it be in terms of input costs and margins, where do you feel the headwinds will continue to come from? Inflation is a major headwind, and uh, why uh, at the macro level there is a huge surge in inflation world over. The Bloomberg Commodity Index, for example, has gone up 67% as compared to 2020 low. And more importantly, this is only the fourth occasion in the past 100 years when worldwide commodity inflation is so high. So I think consumer companies will face that headwind very strongly. Uh, commodities form anywhere between 30 to 60, 65% of the revenue for all FCG companies. So they will have to manage commodity costs much better. And as you know, commodity cycles play differently for different companies. Uh, so it's not one size fit all. Uh, the other other headwind uh, I see is uh, the crude oil prices, which uh, go up. Now, FNCG companies are not directly dependent on crude oil, but they do a lot of plastic packaging. Uh, maybe it forms anywhere between eight to thirteen percent of their revenue. So that uh, crude oil affecting the plastic pricing and that raw material packaging material impact is also something which is significant. In terms of overheads, there may be a general inflation in the country. That is not such a big factor. On the flip side, on the positive flip side, as I mentioned, companies have saved a lot of costs at the structural level during COVID. They have also realized that not all of their advertising and sales promotion is uh, uh, worth the uh, money that they spend. And therefore, there is a rationalization over there. 
Uh, so I think uh, these are the uh, headwinds and tailwinds which FMCG companies will will face. At the sectoral level, I also see another phenomenon playing out, which is that the sector will recover in a K recovery format. The better players in the in the industry will gain more, and the the relatively not so nimble and not so agile players, as Manoj also mentioned rightly, I think they will keep uh, suffering. So you will have a phenomenon where some players do extremely well and some players do really not uh, so well. The other worry which companies should look at, FMCG companies should look at, is that this K phenomenon will work out also as regards consumers. I personally feel that uh, uh, a pandemic, a crisis like this, always makes the rich more rich and poor more poor. And therefore, the classical middle income group may have an upheaval. And companies may have to think of having on one side more discretionary products at the higher end of the spectrum, at the same time have more value for money products for the lower end of the spectrum. So there are interesting times, uh, but challenges ahead, but uh, it looks good for FMCG companies looking at our demographics and the uh, income levels. Okay, on that positive uh, note, uh, Milind as well as Manoj, both of you, thanks as always for taking the time out and speaking with us today. Okay, let's move on. Let's tell you what's happening with the market because you are now.